How many of you I used to be a server? Anybody, anybody know? Yeah. When I was in high school, I started serving at Eastside Mario's in Cambridge, Ontario. A hey, bada boom bada bing. Yeah. There's a culture to Eastside Mario's. Right? All you can eat bread, soup, and salad, along with the entree. It's delicious. It's good. Lots of food. And the price isn't too bad. Our restaurant uh, had a bit of a reputation for being one of the worst in the, the, the chains, the franchise. And so they brought in uh, a management team. And they whipped the place up into tip-top shape. Right? They set a tone for what was acceptable in that restaurant and what was unacceptable. And they started hiring and firing quickly. Right? If you couldn't toe the line. But what you saw them do was they set a tone and they developed a restaurant culture. And within a period of time, because it takes time to shift culture, but in a period of time, it took one of the worst restaurants in the chain of Eastside Mario's, and it became one of the highest grossing restaurants in the chain of Eastside Mario's. And they pointed back to those, that management team that set a new tone, that set a new culture. And they pointed to that and said, that was the result. The fruit of that was higher numbers, more people coming through, higher efficiencies. When I moved to St. Catharines with my wife, I worked at Eastside Mario's. And it wasn't one of the highest grossing restaurants in the chain. In fact, if you know the Eastside Mario's in St. Catharines, it's no longer there. Maybe it's you, John. Maybe it's me. It's no longer there. It was one where you had a different culture. The management team didn't have the same high standards. They let things slide. They cared less about their work. And you saw it. People may have come in, you know, Eastside Mario's is a recognizable brand. I mentioned it earlier and I had a cry of, hey, bada boom, bada bing. The branding is recognizable. The, the, everything about it is recognizable. You know the menu. If you've been to Eastside Mario's, maybe you're coming into another Eastside Mario's and you're hoping for the same thing because it was so great the last time. But whatever it was, the culture wasn't the same, and it went downhill, and like I said, it's no longer there. Culture. Culture. Now, what's fascinating is that culture is a bit of a tricky thing. Culture is real. Culture is real. But define it. That gets a little more difficult. Right? Trying to nail down a culture is a little bit like nailing slime to the wall. I don't know about you guys, but my kids have been all into slime. For I know it's a, few, a little bit late, but they, they watch videos of people making slime, different colors of slime. But you try to hammer that sl slime to the wall, and it's just going to seep all around that nail and land on the floor. There's clearly slime, but when you try to do something to that slime that it wasn't meant to do, it's hard to define. Culture, similarly. It's hard to nail down a culture, but everyone knows a culture. You feel it. You experience it. Right? The thing about culture is that to change a culture is very difficult. So that management team that came in changed the culture of that restaurant. Right? And they did it over a period of time. There is a big business out there in pretty much every industry you can name where there's consultants and coaches and people that can help you with your culture, your organizational culture. And I have once sat through, there was a church I was serving in. 
that brought in a consultant to help with church culture. And there's meetings and conversations. And then at the end of a period of time, he brought a whole bunch of recommendations to impact the culture. Now, I got to tell you something. With all the money that was forked out to this consultant, we didn't read the report. And all of a sudden, a new culture was there in the church. Because, friends, culture is not like a present that you open on Sunday morning or on Christmas morning under the Christmas tree, where you open it up, you pull it out, and your parents have made sure that the batteries are already in there so that you can get, get going. <laughs> Culture's not like that. Culture needs to be cultivated. It needs to be cultivated. So, when you think about the cultivation of culture, if you go somewhere that hasn't had a lot of intentionality to the culture, it will be very much like a wild plot of forest. Overgrown, right? Trees, bushes. There may be a lot of beauty in that accidental culture. But it's there by accident. It's not there with intentionality. But when you think about cultivating culture that is uh, more like a garden, right? Where there's intentionality to the placement of plants. There's intentionality to the spacing, to the rhythms, to the time. There's, managed there's an int intentionality to managing the variables of watering, all the rest of that, right? Cultivating culture. This is why, if you think about when we did some work back heading into 2021, and there was a proposal of mission, vision, values. These are elements that inform culture. But in many respects, like that report that was given by the consultant, they're just words on a page, unless they get lived out. Those denominational distinctives I mentioned earlier, spices, they're just words on a page, unless they get lived out. And it's in the living out that you start to cultivate a culture, right? You live out, you show up, you till the soil of spices. And maybe, okay, something develops here that is a little bit different than the world around us, right? Simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, stewardship, simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, stewardship. You till the soil of a culture, and then the fruit of what comes is hopefully of the same nature of what's cultivated. Now, when we think about the kingdom of God, we've been working through the Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus is teaching that informs his followers. And the Sermon on the Mount is all about uh, invitations to create culture. Invitations to live the Jesus way in the world. Right? Following Jesus isn't like that gift on Christmas morning where, you know, you choose to follow Jesus, you become a Christian, and boom! You wake up and it's fully functioning, working in all the right ways. It's more like that thing you get that you're really excited for and you buy from the yard sale and you realize even with new batteries, it still doesn't work. <laughs> Following Jesus, we end up, we feel maybe we're broken because there's words on a page and yet living them out ends up being so difficult so often. You cultivate a culture. Last week, we were talking about Jesus and his words on judging. And he said, don't judge. We looked at how he talked about plank and, 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 and specks in eyes. And we recognize how difficult that was, especially now. And we drilled down to see that there's a posture of love as one seeks to understand the story underneath the story, right? So there's the story, and then we, love is required to understand the story under the story. You need patience and presence to get there, too. Judging is all about that surface story, but love is about being patient and present long enough to understand what's going on under the surface. 
love. Now, uh, you know, when Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, this is what he said about love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. In these, I see patience and presence. Patience and presence. We need places in the world that's cultivating cultures of non-judgment. Cultures of embracing people as they come and saying, hey, you're loved right where you are. And it's in being loved that you actually experience a little bit of freedom to grow and shift and change and be transformed in the image and likeness of Jesus. Right? So it's, not about, it's about not presuming. It's about trying to gain understanding of all the currents that are going on underneath, the surf, or underneath that surface pre- presentation of who someone is. And this is the only way, patience and presence. Now, I spend a lot of time recalling some of this because this is important. It serves as that, that, that flows into what we're talking about today. Because Jesus continues to unpack a loving posture. One of asking, requesting, and one of invitation. He says in Matthew 7, verses 7 and following, he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, we read these verses. And all too often, and accurately, we jump to this talking about God, right? We ask God, we seek after God, we knock, and the door will be opened when we're seeking God. Now that is true. That's why, again, we encourage you to seek after the living Christ because when you seek him, he will make himself found, right? When you make asks, God will show up in the midst of those asks. And when you knock saying, God, where are you? I want to be with you. The door will be opened. We encourage that. But as we work through, we're going to see also this is about forming culture for the kingdom of God, the people that meet following Jesus. It's about forming a culture of request, not of demand. Right? It's about cultivating a culture of of invitation, not control. When we back away from the judgmental space, right? When you back away from, like, assuming you know someone based on a statement or a surface level, it actually provides a little space. You find yourself free to maintain a little bit more sensitivity and to embrace a little bit more of a non-manipulative presence. Non-manipulative presence. Do you know that every single thing in this world, pretty much everything, maybe an overstatement, but pretty much every single thing in this world is trying to jam you into a certain mold. It's trying to shape you. It's trying to control you. Advertisements. Every day we are bombarded by advertisements. I can't even play Candy Crush on my phone without being bombarded by advertisements. It's trying to control, trying to shape. We don't live in a uh, culture that doesn't care about your formation. No, you're being shaped. You're being formed. It's just what are you being shaped and formed after? And so when we talk about, again, that, that step away from judging, it's about, again, a posture that's trying to seek non manipulative presence. And this is different in a world that's trying to control you. That's trying to make a buck off of you. That's trying to shape you and inform you in an image that serves an agenda and in a purpose. And so we listen. 
We cultivate cultures where we invite people to actually be themselves, to share their ideas and their questions and their doubts and their fears, and recognizing that that is a part of someone, but that doesn't define the person, right? Like we said last week, right? A person is not their ideology, not their doctrine, not their ideas. A person is other than that. And so we listen, we're patient, we're present, we listen, we have openness. And in that openness, it, it invites people, it asks people, it requests people to enter into dialogue, into true communication. We cultivate culture. Cultivate culture. I, I need to say, this, when, when we talk about a world that is out there trying to shape and form you, trying to get your money, trying to get your attention, trying to get you, you know, enveloped in whatever their agenda is, all too often, churches have embraced similar methodology. Unfortunately, try to control, keeping guilt and shame, trying to get your, your attention, right? E trying to get your money, that's a, real, that's a reality. And that, that, that's the, 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 there is a tension to that because obviously, again, money is required to run the, 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 the place and money is a part of stewardship and money is a part of recognizing we're here to serve God and not money. And yet, sometimes money drives the enterprise. Recognizing that. So some churches have got caught up and we're going to shape people, inform people, and we're going to twist people, we're going to manipulate people, we're going to control people. And they end up burning people out. And they end up wounding people. People start to associate those power dynamics and the fear and the guilt and the control with Jesus Christ. And that's wrong. We cultivate cultures of openness, cultivate cultures of invitation, cultures of asking. We have a posture of ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and the one who knocks the door will be opened. Yeah, we approach God in this manner, but it's also the tone in which we approach each other. We ask. We don't demand. We seek. We don't require. We knock. We don't barge in to people's lives. We invite people onto a journey, grab us by the hand, and let's journey towards Jesus. Wherever you come from, whoever you are, whatever it is that you bring in here, whatever the baggage is that you're carrying, we don't wrench and control the process. We try to be faithful and leave the outcomes up to God. In this, Jesus shifts and he kind of bases this. We can ask and seek God because, verse 9 and following, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, we'll give him a steak, snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to you? We serve a God who is generous. A God who is good. A God who is full of grace. He gives generously and freely on the righteous and the unrighteous right? It's interesting here when he's naming fish and bread, these would have been staples of the ancient world, right? It's like, dad, can I have a glass of milk? No, you can't. Of course, right? Yeah, of course. Dad, can I have an apple? No. Well, of course, yes, have an apple, right? When our kids are hungry, we feed them, except when it's past bedtime and you know it's just a way to try to stay up a little later. <laughs> but Jesus, we have this image, like a parent lovingly caring for their kids, so God lovingly cares for us. But notice again, it's a relationship of ask, request, invite. 
And then in verse 12, Jesus loops it back. And this is why, again, that, that, why I can say very clearly, I think Jesus intends this is both, uh, we ask God, we seek after God, we knock for God, but also for each other. This is the tone of the kingdom. This is about developing culture because he says in verse 12, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. This is the golden rule, rule right? Do to others as you would have them to do to you. When we talk about culture building in the kingdom of God, in churches, it's about extending respect to other people in the same way that we want ex respect extended to us. Culture building in the church is different. It's about people traveling at their pace having questions answered in a way that makes sense, right? Moving towards God in a non-manipulative way. It's about having revelation, you know, our eyes open to what God's up to in time. It's not about saying, get here and get here now. God's at work in each of us in our own unique ways. So we ask, we seek, we invite we knock, and when we ask, and we seek, and we invite, and we knock. And we ask, and we seek, and we invite, and we knock. Patiently, with loving presence. And friends, I got to tell you, a church and a people of God that responds to a world in that manner we'll have the door opened. We'll find people willing dialogue partners. We'll be able to find people interested in a God that's behind this non-manipulative posture. It'll be like a breath of fresh air. So we have a mission and a vision we have values. And while it's there to help cultivate the culture, we continue to try to live into it. We do want it to help shape and form who we are and who we're becoming. But that's also why we preach. That's also why we teach. That's also why we talk. That's also why we seek after Jesus, because we hope that it's shaping culture. We long for a place that's non judgmental. We long for a place where we're dealing with the planks in our eyes rather than the specks. We long for a place where there's invitations rather than demands. Non-manipulative presence rather than trying to control. I operate with a faith firmly rooted that Christ is building his church through the person of the Spirit. Ours is to be faithful. Ours is to show up. Ours is to love. Ours is to be present. Ours is to be patient. We're faithful. We can leave the outcomes up to God. Friends, let's just pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that you are at work in the world. I long that you, uh, you are the shaper of our culture. And I know that's hard because you're going to use people as tools to till the soil of our community. And so I pray that we, as those individuals, would be receptive to the moving of your spirit, that we would be soft to your uh, whisper, that we would be quick to forgive, quick to ask for forgiveness, that we'd move in non-judgmental rhythms, that we'd recognize uh, our own brokenness and have the humility to remove planks out of our eyes that we would be present with each other on the journey in a non-manipulative, non-controlling manner. But may we ask, may we seek, and may we knock in order to find you at work in people's lives. And God, we are also pursuing you. In a world that often seems like a barren desert, we long for more of your presence, more of your peace, more of your love. And as we ask you for it, and as we seek after it, and as we knock, may we find it. May the door be open to your presence. 
And Lord God, may you be made manifest in our lives, in our midst. And may a watching world see and come to an understanding of who you are as a result. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.